Good morning, everyone. Um, I took over this talk on a quite short notice, but unfortunately, the closure of the Jubilee line just ruined a bit my quite tight time schedule. Um, um, I'm going to talk to you about the clinical implication of septal surgery and also about like my thoughts of in septal surgery because, as you will see, it's an operation that is performed really often, but uh, I would say at least 80% of the surgery that I'm doing at uh, Guys and Thomas Hospital is revision surgery in after septal surgery, and I'll show you a couple of clinical cases. My disclosures are I'm doing consulting for Intellis. Um, in England, we have far more than um, 20,000 septoplasties performed per year. I think at the moment we are reaching more than 30,000 mark. And it's often one of the first operation um, procedures learned by trainees. I've done my training in Germany, and when we had a look at the septal perforation rate, um, we found out a figure of about 250,000 septoplasties performed in Germany if you, conclude the pri or if you combine the private and the um, uh, public sector together. But if you look at the surgery, we've got a tenfold variation in um, the surgical intervention rates. The training is very often inadequate, and I can talk like from my own experience that I had as a um, junior. It's hard to see sometimes what the consultant is doing. Um, and it has the highest cause of um, litigations in rhinolo rhinology. And if you look at the overall um, literature, and there's just one um, uh, study published in the European Archives um, of um, um, Otolaryngology, the patient satisfaction rate on long-term studies is quite poor with about 40%. So what is the indication for septal surgery? Um, the general population is said to have about 80% of the population has um, a septal deviation but just 30% of the population is complaining of nasal obstruction if you look at um, random population samples. Um, and just one in four of these have a septal deviation that is thought to contribute to nasal obstruction. So three in four patients with nasal obstruction do not have a septal deviation, which accounts for their nasal obstruction. Most likely it's... Um, um, inflammation, it's rhinitis, the turbinates, adenoids, etc., polyps. So, what symptoms does a proper septal deviation cause? We know that it's often a persistent, predominantly unilateral um, nasal obstruction, um, which presents orally quite in the young adult life or following trauma. A septal deviation can cause snoring, can cause epistaxis, because the, on, this, uh, on the side of the deviation, the um, uh, mucosa can get quite thin and you can get recurrent bleedings. And this is also often associated with um, um, septal deviation. But what is the, really the impact on headaches, uh, recurrent acute rhinosinusitis, or middle ear infection, post-nasal drip, and voice problems? I'm just going to pick out a couple of these ones um, now. If you look at uh, septoplasty and snoring, there is quite good data for patients with a BMI of under 28. And we know that a septoplasty, if the indication is right, uh, may achieve really significant improvements in snoring outcome surgery, um, the adverse sleepness scale, and the nasal obstruction symptom score is um, uh, reduced. The response rate in these, um, uh, K in these um, studies are overall quite low, as up to 50%. If you look at patients with a BMI over 28, the su uh, success rate of septoplasty is not predictable, or not much predictable, and um, when I perform snoring or obstructive sleep surgery, um, it's always a leveled surgery, and I'm tell telling every patient, as soon as they've got obstructive sleep apnea with a bit of a higher BMI, um, there's no chance that I can cure it with a purely, um, just with a septoplasty. If you look at data to recurrent acute um, sinusitis, there's no literature that supports a causative role of a deviated septum for recurrent acute sinusitis. When I look back into my training time in Germany, we had to operate almost everyone with a deviated septum just because of this cause, but there is no literature that supports a septal deviation. It's the cause of recurrent acute sinusitis. 
There is some evidence um, and some clinical or cost effectiveness if you perform endoscopic sinus surgery in patients with um, recurrent acute rhinosinusitis, but the septum is just done if you need a better access. If you can't access the middle meatus, then you perform a septal deviation or a septal mobilization um, to cure these recurrent acute rhinosinusitis. If you look at middle ear infection or Eustachian tube dysfunction, and there are, uh, is a big study in Germany that undertook detailed um, tubal investigations pre and post septoplasty. And I mean, this is quite, I mean, I understand this completely that significant deterioration of, of Eustachian tube uh, function one week after septoplasty. You've got swelling, you've got maybe a bit of blood clots in the, in the tube. This is normal, but if you look at the um, six to eight weeks post septoplasty, the function of the Eustachian tube um, returned to the baseline, and there was no evidence of improvement in Eustachian tube dysfunction compared with baselines um, at four to six months post um, septoplasty. What are now the indications for septoplasty? If you have someone with a constant or predominantly unilateral nasal obstruction of lung standing duration or is related to trauma, um, less frequently snoring or epistaxis, and from my point of view, an important indication is aesthetic reasons, because there's a, say, a saying where the nose goes, goes the septum, so you really have to straighten the nose to get a proper aesthetic outcome. If we look at the anatomy, we've got the uh, quadrangular cartilage here attached to the ethmoid plate, vomer, a bit of the maxillary crest here, the premaxilla and the anterior nasal spine. There are different operative techniques for a septoplasty. It's always the question, Kilian versus Kotl. Um, if you look at um, computational flow dynamic studies and rhinomanometry, they've shown that anterior um, deviations may at least double the nasal airway. These posterior spurs have little effect on it. The nasal valve, which is not... Um, the topic of this talk has about 80% um, um, nasal airway resistance, or causes 80% nasal airway resistance. So the anterior part is the most important part. So if, if you can conclude, if a septoplasty can be effectively done using a Killian's incision, then the patient shouldn't be on the table. What are the essentials of septal surgery? Um, from my point of view, it's very important to completely mobilize um, the septum and uh, the mucosa on its side of the deviation, and more and more I'm mobilizing also at the side of the deviation the contralateral mucosa, as I think the attachments between um, perichondrium and septum can be quite strong. Um, preserve an adequate um, cartilage um, support anteriorly here and superior the, the L strut, I have to say, when I perform a septoplasty, I don't think about L struts because um, I try just to remove minimal amounts of cartilage, especially in the junctions between bone and cartilage, the so-called um, swinging door technique. And in, if it's just a purely septoplasty, I normally um, yeah, just remove minimal amounts so I don't have to think of an L strut. But this, the L strut is the minimal support um, you have to leave after a septoplasty. You have to re, um, restore or maintain adequate fixation um, of the radial, uh, residual cartilage, and I will talk about this a bit later. Because if you look at the attachment points, the, the, the important ones um, are, if these are the attachment points, but the important ones are the anterior nasal spine and this one here at the K area. So it's important to refix at least two of these, otherwise you can get a droopy tip or what we see very often, a settle nose deformity post septoplasty. This is one patient with a proper settle um, post septoplasty that I had to reconstruct. The problem was this patient also had a big septal perforation, but unfortunately she has a diabetes incipitus, so she needs her nasal spray. So the last thing that I want to do is alter or change or destroy even more her um, uh, nasal mucosa. This is why this one was just done with an onlay graft. She's also a septal, um, uh, like a settal nose post um, uh, septoplasty due to oversection, which was also um, corrected with an open approach. Um, what you have to do is you have to fix the septum here to the anterior nasal spine. I use the PDS suture 4.0 in almost all the cases. 
Um, you can also use a tongue and groove technique to even get more fixation here and, and um, fix the, um, the medial crura of the lower laterals to the septum. Be careful if you do it too significantly, you get a retracted columella. You have to make sure that you've got enough space and um, uh, or uh, put a graft in here to, um, for the proper stabilization. And um, the columella fixation sutures are important that uh, you don't get a caudal dislocation of um, the septum. This is just one technique. Um, this was published by, uh, by Claire Hopkins, um, I think already 1999. Um, incision is done on the side of the deviation and you can do uh, you can correct this anterior deviation with a suture to the contralateral side the incision here is done on the left side i do all my incisions on the right side but this is a personal preference <clears throat> and this is one of these patients with a subluxated um, uh, septum and this is the post-op result placed into the middle and i've used here an open approach with a um, uh, um, tongue and groove technique and a uh, septal extension graft. Always the a question regarding open versus close. If you've got a significant anterior deviation, I more and more do open approaches because I just see everything better. I can also deal in the same um, uh, approach with the medial cross of the lower laterals, with give, which gives me a long-lasting and stable result postoperatively. Um, if it's a revision and if um, there is a loss of tip support, I definitely do an open approach. If you have lower lateral problems as well as septal problems, you have to open up the nose. If it's aesthetic, in my hand, an open approach is, um, the I would say, about 90% that I'm using. And this is another patient. She had almost a retracted, but also deviated or luxated septum to the left side. The tip was asymmetric and shifted to the right side. And the only way to reconstruct this was with an open approach. The question is, do we need the extracorporeal septoplasty? Um, there are studies, especially from Germany, with more than 5,000 included patients where it works really well. Um, Extracorporeal means you remove the whole septum, you refixate it, you straighten it, and you have to replant the septum and fix it on the nasal spine, but also on the dorsal um, border um, to the um, nasion and uh, the upper lateral cartilage. The problem is this technique is difficult, especially the refixation um, in the, to the nasal bone at the key area is not easy. Um, you can have the risk of settling. So if possible, I just perform a partial or modified extracorporeal septoplasty, and I leave the bony cartilaginous junction, the keystone area, intact. This is just a diagram where you can see this one. I try to leave this area intact, and I can play with the rest and reconstruct the l strut, fix it here with um, spreader grafts, and then fix it to the upper lateral cartilage, which gives me a stable um, result and a stable dorsum. If you harvest a cartilage of the septum, and I'm not a good drawer, but uh, I hope I can, uh, I've circled the three important points for me. If you harvest cartilage, this is, thing, this is the part that you can harvest easily from a septum. You have to be careful. This is the anterior nasal spine, and the septum doesn't go straight to the bone. It has a little, it goes backwards here. It goes dorsally at the front part. So make sure you also do a little back cut um, when you remove the cartilage. Otherwise, if you just go down straight, this one here is becoming too thin and you don't have proper support. The, th the second tip or trick that I'm doing is I'll do a little back cut here as well. That, that I've got a longer attachment to the bone, which gives me a bit more stability. And the third point is we always, we're getting taught to do, to, that you'll have to leave an L strut. But if you look at the roof, this would be your L strut, but the roof is stabilized with these, um, with these wooden construct here. And I'll do the same. So I also do a little back cut here that I have a bit more stability in this area because there are studies, especially Charles East here in London has really nice studies where he sees fracture lines exactly in this area. Um, post septoplasty or post septorhinoplasty. The question is if you perform uh, extracorporeal, partial extracorporeal um, septoplasty, PDS foil or ethmoid bone, my personal opinion, and uh, there are also studies showing that PDS can create a long lasting mild inflammation in the nose. I'm not using PDS if I don't have to. 
I'll try to use ethmoid bone, drill a little nice hole in there. You can use a, um, just a little needle. Um, uh, you don't need a drill. And this one here really stabilized the septum nicely. I will uh, end this uh, case with a really difficult septum. This lady had a nasal trauma with pre, uh, three, uh, four previous nasal procedures. First one was a septoplasty and then three open revision procedures. Almost the complete septum was resected. Um, the upper laterals and the lower laterals were partially resected, and I had to reconstruct it with a tutoplast and temporalis fascia. The patient didn't want to have a, a rib graft harvest. This is the case um, where you can see I mean, the whole septum and everything here was gone. Um, I think the only thing that was holding the shape of the nose was the soft tissue and a bit of remnants of the lower lateral cartilages. And, um, it was reconstructed here. You can see the tutoplast with a proper L strut. The lower laterals were reconstructed with temporalis fascia, and this is a three weeks um, post op um, result. How can we reduce the risk of complications in septal surgery? Personally, I avoid a gauge or chisel at the maxillary crest. This can increase the risk of paresthesia, but also the risk of bleeding. What I'll try is I use a Blakesley or a bone crusher and just gently like smoothen everything and slim everything without removing too much of the bone. If you've got multiple tears um, in the septal flap or after septal perforation, um, I use quilting sutures and splints. Um, in a normal septoplasty, I also use um, quilting sutures. It takes a bit time to, to um, position them nicely, but it's much nicer not to have any splints in the nose or any nasal packing. And there are nice studies showing, um, especially done in Germany, is there, I would guess, about 90% of the patients are still packed for one or two days post septoplasty. Um, the removing of the package is the most horrible um, part of the whole journey um, from first consultation to the um, post-op visits. Um, yeah, this is what I just said. That re uh, uh, systematic reviews have shown that quilting sutures are as effective as packs. Um, there is no evidence to support uh, routine um, the use of antibiotics, and um, I hope that I could highlight a bit the importance of uh, a properly performed septoplasty. Thank you very much.